your table that you do have some blank pieces of paper, so you can just leave that there until that activity starts. Um, and we do have some pens for you, but not enough for every single person, perhaps, so we can perhaps share. Um, so those presentations will be followed by a two-part community dialogue, which includes reflections on the presentations, a question and answer period, and then an opportunity for the speakers, along with attendees, to consider what action can be taken to address racism. Finally, there will be an open networking event with some um, session with some additional food served. Throughout the night, we ask that you participate in dialogues mindfully, taking into consideration that discussing race, power, and privilege can be a difficult conversation to have with both ourselves and others. This be means being willing to sit through discomfort that may arise in the process of learning and unlearning, as well as considering the needs of racialized attendees. While we are all here to learn from one another, we should acknowledge our differential social locations and that we are all embedded within a structure of within a structure and system that has historically devalued the voices and power of racialized people. Keeping this in mind, it is important for all of us to move through this space with an awareness of the voices that are often silenced and or unheard. And the voices that often have taken over, whether consciously or implicitly. Also, I know that this event is being live streamed with captions. So for those that couldn't be here physically tonight, uh, they are joining. So hello to them. Um, also, if you're here tonight and physically would like to follow along with the captions, you can click on the link on the screen. Uh, it's also on our Twitter, if you're looking for the link, and you can follow along the captions on your phone. For those joining remotely during the question periods, you can participate by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the page. So you'll have to enter a username, but leave the password filled blank. We have some members of Diversity Moved Us, a student-led equity group from U of T Sport and Rec who will be assisting throughout the night. So they're, they're in green shirts at the back of the room. They want to give us a peace sign and wave. Hello. Um, and, and so they may join in on some of the conversations we're having. And I do want to recognize that this is an ongoing conversation so and the spark of a conversation. So I expect that we will be covering lots of questions and, and uh, ideas for conversations to have but that we might not have time to answer all of today, but I encourage you to continue the conversation and learning, and you can also have that conversation with us on Twitter at U of T Med underscore OID. Um, there will be several group discussions, um, and then we're gonna bring everyone's attention back to the front of the room, so just be aware of that, that we're um, going to do some short activities and call everyone's attention back. Um, I would now like to introduce you to Dr. Lisa Robinson. Dr. Robinson is the Associate Dean of Inclusion and Diversity at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Medicine. She's a senior. She's a senior. Um, a scientist of a cell biology program at the Hospital for Sick Children Research Institute, head of the Division of Nephrology at the Hospital for Sick Children, a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto, and a full member of the Institute of Medical Science at U of T. Please welcome Dr. Robinson. very much, Annan, and um, it is so wonderful to see all of you here tonight, um, and I'm going to apologize in advance because I've been sick, so I'm just getting over something, so if I sound a little scratchy, that's why I'm doing this. Um, so again, welcome everybody. Um, we're so excited to have you here, and as you know, this event um, is aiming to provide healthcare practitioners, learners, scientists, and staff with tools and frameworks to discuss race because we know that in order to achieve cultural safety and inclusion in healthcare services, research, and education, it is vital to understand how race, power, and privilege operate in these spaces. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land. The sacred land on which the Faculty of Medicine operates has been the site of human activity for thousands of years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the land around the resources around the Great Lakes. 
Today, Toronto is also the home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this important traditional territory. And I just wanted to take a moment to re reflect a little bit further on why this land acknowledgement is so important for us to engage with before beginning this gathering. A land acknowledgement contributes to decolonization and reconciliation by respectfully recognizing indigenous inhabitants of the land and challenging the ideologies furthered by the doctrine of discovery, recognizing and naming that the land was not empty when Europeans first arrived on Turtle Island. In their 2015 report entitled First Peoples, Second Class Treatment, Drs. Billy Allen and Janet Smiley write, we end where we began. We as indigenous peoples must be the authors of our own stories. It's necessary to interrupting the racism that reduces our humanity, erases our histories, discounts our health knowledge and practices, and attributes our health disparities and social ills to individual and collective deficits instead of hundreds of years of violence, marginalization, and exclusion. It's time for stories of change, change in how we imagine, develop, implement, and evaluate health policies, services, and education, change in how we talk about racism and history in this country. This is fundamental to shifting what is imagined and understood about our histories, our ways of knowing and being, our present and our future, and to ensuring the health and well being of our peoples for this generation and generations to come. Tonight, as this event aims to facilitate community thought, dialogue, and action on addressing and dismantling racism in health services, research, and education, I invite you to foreground conversations about decolonization, truth, and reconciliation, and importantly, the part that you will play. As many of you know, the Faculty of Medicine uh, recently launched its strategic plan, and one of the key pillars is excellence through equity. But we can only truly be excellent when the diverse voices of our community can fully contribute to the educational, scientific, and healthcare mission. And historically, racialized people, and most notably Indigenous people, Black people, and Filipino people, have been completely absent from our spaces. While we're making important gains in enhancing access to medical school, there's still so much work to do to ensure that our faculty and our leaders reflect our community. This is difficult work. I know this firsthand, as many of you in the room do. And indeed, for many programs that we have introduced, gender equity has been very well embraced. But the same programs um, that we, which we have tailored and designed to enhance access, mentorship, and career development for racialized people have been met with some pushback. So today, the day after we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy, I recognize that equity will not be achieved until we create spaces where uncomfortable conversations about race can happen. And as Shannon said, this means spaces in which people can sit with their discomfort to learn, to challenge themselves, and to grow. Tonight is a first step. I'm very grateful to the people who do this, this difficult work, often at professional and personal expense, because it's your courage that allows us to move forward. So I'm very, very, very excited um, to introduce to you our phenomenal experts um, who will be speaking to us and leading us through thinking about how we talk about race and health. So I'm just going to um, very quickly read their bios to you, um, and I'm going to start. Oh, sorry. Oh, perfect. Okay. So first, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Rithika Gohl, who completed medical school at McMaster University and then did family medicine residency at St. Michael's Hospital. And she also completed a Master of Public Health, Master's of Public Health from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. She served as both the lead physician at the inner city family health team and the population health lead for ICHA. Her clinical work with ICHA is based on sistering a women's, women's drop-in center and FCJ refugee center working with uninsured migrants. She's a board member of the Scarborough Community Volunteer Clinic for the Uninsured, Canadian Doctors for Medicare, and co-chair of the Ontario College of Family Physicians Poverty and Health Committee. Dr. Goal has been involved in health-related activism since medical school, and she's currently part of the steering committee um, for, of OHIP for All, the OHIP for All campaign, as well as the Decent Work and Health Network. 
And secondly, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Janelle Joseph. Dr. Joseph is an educator with 22 years of experience in andragogical teaching, a portfolio of dozens of peer-reviewed articles, and award-winning research, including three books. Her most recent book is titled Sport in the Black Atlantic, and, this ex and examines the intersections of community, gender, race, and dias diaspora studies. Dr. Joseph is dedicated to transformative ethnographies, critical pedagogies, creative leadership, and organizational excellence. She's the former director of academic success and assistant director of the transitional year program at the University of Toronto. And in these roles, she specialized in graduate student writing, equity in and access to post-secondary education, and imposter phenomenon in education. Dr. Joseph is currently an assistant professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education here at U of T with research projects focused on movement, race, equity, and learning. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Janet Smiley, who is a family physician and public health researcher. She currently works as a research scientist at St. Michael's Hospital Center for Research on Inner City Health, where she directs the Well Living House Applied uh, Research Center for Indigenous Infant, Child, and Family Health. Her primary academic appointment is as a professor in the Dalla Lana School of Public Health here at U of T. She maintains a part-time clinical practice at Seventh Generation Midwives Toronto. She's a member of the Métis Nation of Ontario with Métis roots in Saskatchewan. Her research interests are focused in the area of addressing the health inequities that challenge Indigenous infants, children, and their families through applied health services research. Dr. Smiley holds the CIHR Applied Public Health Research Chair in Indigenous Health Knowledge. She's also the mother of eight children, including twin boys and four adults. That's the best part. <laughs> and lastly, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Nixon. Dr. Nixon is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and cross-appointed at the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute and the Dalla Lana School of Public Health here at U of T. She's also the director of the International Center for Disability and Rehabilitation. Dr. Nixon has been a physiotherapist, HIV activist, and global health researcher for over two decades. And in recent years, she's had the good fortune to lead capacity building with clinicians, health administrators, researchers, and students about privilege and its relationship with health equity. So please join me in welcoming all of our amazing guests. everyone. So thank you so much for this great honor. I've, I'm extremely excited not just to be here with you all today to learn from my co-panelists, but also to have a conversation and uh, learn from each other. So I'm going to be really just thinking about and helping us all think about how we ground our conversations on race and racism in a broader discussion about anti-oppression. We will be focusing in on race, but we want to make sure that we've got a broader kind of lens and a way to approach these discussions before we get started. So to start, I'm going to present to you three different situations or, or media stories that I want you to consider. So the first is a story from the CBC. The headline is Transgender Patients Face Healthcare Discrimination and Inadequate Treatment. And the individual in the photo there, Alex Abramovich, who is a health researcher at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, stated, I can speak from my own personal experience that one of the most challenging parts of my coming out process has been access to healthcare. He also recalled multiple instances of being called she being stared at and having providers look away. The second is a, a research study that looked at women's pain, particularly in the emergency room of a thousand patients, where men and women reported similar pain scores. And they found that the women were 13 to 25% less likely than the men to receive opioid pain medications. 
and that the women on average waited 65 minutes versus 49 minutes for the men to receive that pain medication. And then the third, people may recognize this woman's photo. This is Michelle Labreck, who's an Oneida woman from Victoria, BC, who went to the emergency room with severe stomach pain. She disclosed some challenges with alcohol and housing. And she was given this prescription in response. Can people see what the prescription is showing? So for people at the back, if you can't see, the, she got home, she thought that she was given a prescription for a medication. She got home, she opened the piece of paper and she saw that in fact, it's a picture of a beer bottle with an X through it. So I'm gonna ask you to just take a minute, turn to your neighbor and just think about what are some of the common threads in these three situations. Just a minute and then we can talk together. So I said a minute and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> so I'm going to bring you all back together. I'm sure the juices are just starting to flow. But we're going to bring everyone back together. So does anybody want to share? Does anybody want to share some of what you talked about? So what are some of the common threads in these three situations? You can just yell it out. Or discrimination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. stereotyping. stereotyping that happened yeah bias. absolutely bias disrespect. disrespect lack of compassion yeah they're injuring the patient, injuring the patient. yeah which some of the with, with the things that happened shutting, shutting down people's voices what about some, some similarities between some of the, the people who were impacted? Are there any similarities there? So vulnerable is, is one word, yeah. You could say marginalized. There's other words. In one case, uh, uh, women were they all, yeah. Uh, the first person was a trans man actually, yeah. Yeah, so there's some commonalities, right? So the question is, what is it that holds all of these folks together? And we're gonna talk more about that, but that's the thread that we're talking about is how are different groups in society impacted through the impact of history and policies and laws and structures that maintain people's oppression? And how does that impact their healthcare? How does that impact the bias that they face? How does that impact all of those things that you talked about, the lack of compassion, the injury, et cetera? So the focus of today's discussion really is about power, right? So in all of those situations, the people who experienced discrimination or bias were at a decreased level of power. And in healthcare, we inherently are always given power over our patients. As researchers, we're given power over our research subjects. As teachers were given power over our trainees. So we want to be thinking a lot about power today. And so to just make sure that we're all on the same page, although this may be elementary for some, there's some definitions that I want to start with. So first is thinking about privilege. So privilege can be in this case, sorry, oh, can be symbolized, oh sorry, I thought you couldn't hear, um, can be symbolized as this idea of a card that you have a membership card, something that you gain access to due to a particular identity, or a knapsack. And I particularly like this image because I present a lot to medical students, and you may know that when you start medical school, you actually get a knapsack, a knapsack that represents your, your privilege in a way because people 
cart around the world and you can always recognize when someone else is a medical student or used to be a medical student, figure out what year they were, etc. And so this, this notion of a privilege um, knapsack comes from Peggy McIntosh, who wrote this seminal essay on white privilege specifically. She talks about privilege as an invisible weightless backpack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. And so what does that mean? It's really just about having uh, membership in a particular group that benefits from those societal power structures that exist and can manifest in an interpersonal way, often with positive assumptions or associations about an individual, or as a structural way, manifesting in unequal access, more access because of your membership to a particular group. And that's mediated through the history, um, that's privileged the group through legal structures, resources, and access. Often this is considered the dominant group in a society. And then on the flip side, we talk about oppression. So that can be symbolized as being, you know, um, hands being bound or being under, under the boots. So this notion of an unjust use of power to enforce an unequal relationship and deny another's rights or value. And that's in a way the flip side. So experience due to membership in a particular group that holds less power. And that can manifest as the opposite interpersonally with negative unconscious associations and bias or structurally uh, with unequal barriers to access. Again, similarly through history, and often part of the statistical minority, though not necessarily always. And the most uh, famous example I think of is apartheid in South Africa, where the statistical minority was still the group that held more power. So this is, this is an image that I like to use to really think about what it looks like to experience privilege and power, and also to be unaware of the fact that there may be a group that's on the other side and not able to experience the same benefits that you are. So this is um, a, no uh, a model that's taken by Dr. Kamara Jones from the American Public Health Association, and she talks about this idea of being at a restaurant close to closing time, where the people who are inside the restaurant are seeing the sign that says open. And there are people standing outside the restaurant that just barely missed the entry time and now it says closed. So for them it says closed and they're kind of hanging around outside. They really wanna be able to eat, but the restaurant says closed. And the people inside had no idea that the people outside can't eat, can't get in. Um, and I know Stephanie Nixon is gonna, is gonna present a model that she has as well that, that talks about similar ideas. So thinking about what these different factors are, these different identities, we talked about some of the, the cases earlier. This is the best image that I found that kind of lays out some of these identities for us. And I particularly like this image because it separates out the, in, the inside, which are visibly identifiable factors from ones that are a little bit less easily visible visual basically. So inside you'll see things like age, race and ethnicity, mental and physical ability, sexual orientation, national origin, gender, gender identity or expression. Obviously some of these things are variable in how visible they are. And on the outside you'll see things like work experience, education, political beliefs, family, organizational roles, language and communication skills, income, religion, appearance. Um, this is not complete. It is missing uh, immigration status. It's missing um, uh, a country of origins if you're in the global north, global south, and I'm sure there's other things that's missing, but it's the best that I found. And so thinking about, for the marginalized group, what does this really look like on a day-to-day -day basis? So how many people are familiar with the term microaggressions? Yes, this has now kind of become common parlance. So microaggressions are, are something that you can think of as a small symptom, kind of like a constant reminder of those structures that exist. Um, but it's really the structures of oppression that are the disease, right? So that's what we're trying to actually get to. So some examples, um, a microaggression would, might be as a Muslim person being treated differently for wearing religious symbols. But a structure of oppression is the actual social construct of a terrorist being equated with being Muslim through images, films, news stories, and political rhetoric all around us. A microaggression might be as someone living in poverty, watching others buy luxury items when you can't even afford your basic needs. But the structure of oppression is economic policies that contribute to income inequality and benefit those with higher incomes or wealth. A microaggression might be as a trans or gender non-binary individual, having people constantly ask you, what's your real name? But it's stru the structure of oppression is having to be labeled as having a mental illness to be able to gain access to hormones or surgery. 
as an Indigenous person, a microaggression might be seeing Canada 150 be celebrated with great fanfare and being constantly reminded of the erasure of your history. But the structure of oppression would be the Indian Act and the reserve systems that were designed to segregate Indigenous people away from major metropolitan areas. So on the other side, in a way, the experiences of marginalization, especially for, for those people who experience them, can be easier to see. They're harder to see for the people that don't experience them. Because the thing that we often all grapple with is how to see our own privilege. So daily experiences of privilege, again, are the symptoms, but systemic advantages really are, are the disease. So daily experiences would be things like seeing people that look like you or people that are like you of your race, your gender, your religion, your ability, your appearance represented positively in the media. You might not even notice it's happening, right? But the systemic advantage is that more people of your race and gender, religion, ability, appearance are likely working in the media and therefore they're actually shaping the stories. A daily experience of privilege might be as a heterosexual person being able to easily express affection with your partner in social situations. But the systemic advantage is laws that are designed to support your ability to access benefits in the event of your partner's death. And another would be as a man being assumed to be more confident, decisive, and more of a natural leader. Whereas the system systemic advantage is that there are more men in political office and then they have the ability to write laws that impact the lives of women. So this conversation cannot be had without first sort of paying homage to the women, um, uh, not coincidentally black women, that brought us to this moment um, and that have really helped us understand concepts of anti-oppression and intersectionality, particularly at the time of um, civil rights and women's liberation happening at the same time. It was black women that noticed that neither movement really quite addressed their issues. And so we talk about intersectionality, a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, which is about thinking not just about one dimension, and this is really important today as we're going to talk more about race, but to remember how all of these dimensions are constantly connected and that for people that are experiencing more than one marginalization, uh, this is not about separating out people's identities, but really understanding how those things all go together won't read this, but um, an anti-oppressive lens is really what we're talking about. It's about constantly thinking about how power plays out in all of our interactions and understanding how it goes through all of the systems that we're working in. So why does this matter in healthcare? Any guesses? Right, so we're working with people who might be looking for us to advocate for them and also that are expecting that they're going to get treatment that will not include bias. Fair treatment, just treatment. Other thoughts? Right, these are really, really important things. We are, we are literally dealing with people's lives. Absolutely. We're going to switch places now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Janet hits it right on the money, which is that the system we work in is already oppressive. That's how it's been built. So if we don't see it, if we don't try to see it, then we will actually reinforce that. Yeah.
So I think so. I heard I heard a couple of things. So I heard you're right. There is actually data around income inequality in particular countries and links to improved health with less income inequality. And I think your like your main takeaway was really that power operates everywhere, and we are all impacted if we're not thinking about these things. Um, so it's really important to think about them. So we are taught to be objective. This is so dangerous as healthcare providers, but in fact, our unconscious biases impact our patients' lives and our health all the time. The systems we work in often perpetuate the structural oppression rather than alleviate it, and those structures are actually often designed to be invisible to us. So we need to be able to see them and challenge them. And then we know that oppression kills. We know from the social determinants of health research um, that that's you know, the inequity, inequities that exist and the health outcomes as a result, but it's really about getting to the roots of why those inequities are there. And at the end of the day, we all have power and the ability to use it. So um, I'm, I'm gonna, is that time to do the activity, you think? Yeah, so I'm gonna get us to just really quickly reflect a little bit and try to think about our own social location and privilege. So seeing our own privilege is hard, it's often invisible, we often don't have an awareness of others' lived realities, it's really hard to think about ourselves as having power and benefiting from a system that oppresses other people. Uh, and there's a narrative often of having earned everything that we have through hard work alone that can be really hard to break. And sometimes there can be defensiveness, right? We can feel like we're being accused of interpersonal discrimination. I find this particularly comes up with the topic of race, right? It's a constant jump to, you're calling me a racist. And so trying to move away from that and trying to think more about structures. Often it also leaves us unsure of what to do. So very quickly, so for me, it's really easy for me to see myself as a woman, I see myself as an immigrant, I see myself as a South Asian woman, a person of color, someone who's of a non-dominant cu cultural religion in this society, but I have to do a lot of work to think of myself as a settler, as somebody who's able-bodied, as somebody who is a citizen, who lives in the global north, who is of a particular age that's not very um, precarious, who has language proficiency, who's cisgendered, heterosexual, et cetera. So the list goes on. But the point is to think about where you sit and where it is that you have the ability to impact somebody else's experience. So I circled here the things that particularly are relevant to all physicians. Um, uh, for us to realize the, uh, the inherent power that we hold for those who are physicians in the room and particularly uh, for all healthcare providers, but particularly for physicians. So if we have a minute, if that's still okay, yeah, why don't we take a minute, just, just reflect and um, share with your, with your group. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put the questions up. The questions are, what are you reflecting on? These are the questions. Okay, I'm gonna cut everybody off again. Sorry. I know the one minute is just so cruel. So maybe we can just get three very quick reflections. See, there's so much to talk about after the event is over. So, and when there's food. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna get everybody just to pay attention again. Hello. <laughs> okay, so we'll get three really quick reflections. So anybody wanna share some of what you reflected in terms of your own social location or something that came up for you? You can yell it out again or put up your hand.
Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, okay, for the live stream. So um, the comment, I, I hope I do justice, was about um, being able to have income security right now because you're on leave for an injury, uh, but being able to pay your rent, being able to have uh, food, be able to buy your groceries and just um, the, the privilege of that. Yeah. Anyone else? Maybe one more person to reflect real quick. Yes. Um, I actually find that some of my categories that I came from both, so as a black female, um, it's definitely seen to me as being marginalized, but within my community, I think that's the case compared to how black people were treated in previous societies. So I feel that my, my own reflections and views feel good within different categories. Right. Right, and thank you for adding nuance because the whole point is that this is all really complex, it's all really nuanced, and getting into that nuance is what we want to do. So very quickly, I'm going to bring us back to those first three stories or cases that I had talked about at the beginning and just talk through some of what's already come up, which is what do these have in common? They have in common that all of these groups that we're talking about, trans folks, women, indigenous people, experience health inequity. So as health researchers, as people interested in equity, we often know that, that that's health inequity is what they experience. They also experience implicit bias um, in healthcare. But what we talk a bit less about is that these groups have faced centuries of intentional oppression as a result of laws, policies, actions instituted by the state, uh, as well as often by communities. And that's what I think we want to delve into today. Those historical and present power structures have been created by the dominant group, which has held power. And that's also part of the discomfort of this conversation, because for some of us, we belong to that dominant group of having benefited from those power structures and continuing to. And these structures are all linked. So whether we're talking about racism today or we want to talk about patriarchy or heterosexism or colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy, neoliberalism, they're all linked. So we actually can't just talk about racism. We have to be able to see how these are all connected. Um, and you know, if we look at the history, really the world that we're talking about today has been built by a particular group which has been historically men, cisgender, heterosexual, white European, able-bodied individuals with wealth and power. So that's a very specific group of people, right? Um, and those power structures play out in multiple realms. So we're talking about interpersonal, we talked about organizational, structural, and pretty much all of the structures that are around us are impacted. So where does race fit in? We'll get into this um, with the specific histories, but thinking about Canada, race, uh, has its own specific history. So that starts with the colonization of indigenous lands. It continues uh, with the slavery of African peoples, which happened in Canada, something that we often don't talk about and learn about. Um, it has to do with immigration policies that discourage certain groups and in many ways continue to discourage certain groups from, from immigrating and ongoing structures of particular systems that disproportionately impact particular communities. So what we're hoping that you can do today, aside from thinking about racism specifically, is also learn about this broader process of critical reflection. So think about how we hold power, how power structures work, and if that's about thinking in a healthcare context, think about how a particular patient or a research subject or a student or a colleague might be impacted by broader power structures in society. Think about what your role might be in those power structures, what you can do to decrease your power dynamic between yourself and that individual. Um, what unconscious biases you might hold that you can challenge, and finally, how you can use your power to be an ally or an accomplice. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's important for me to hear you so I can get to know you as much as I can through this formal exchange. 
Uh, normally, I would begin my talk with a land acknowledgement, but Dr. Robinson helped us with that. Um, and so rather than honoring the land from which we come, I would like to spend some time honoring our, the people, our ancestors, those who have come before us and have allowed each and every one of us to be here in this room today. In 2004, for my master's degree and 2010 for my postdoctoral research projects, I focused on a Brazilian martial art that's called capoeira, as it's played in Canada and New Zealand, respectively. My participants shared that one of the most valuable elements of becoming a capoeirista, as they're called, is that they had an opportunity to join a family, to join a community that was led by a black Brazilian man. They devoted to learning the languages of uh, their Afro-Brazilian, of his Afro-Brazilian ancestors, and sharing songs while they play, fight, and dance in a circle. You see a half circle that's depicted here, and the simultaneous dancing, fighting, playing, instrumental, and vocal music are essential to creating a sense of community. I wish I could share a capoeira circle with you right now, but I'll restrict myself to sharing the music. I'd like to begin my talk on critical race theory with an antiphonic song inspired by my research on capoeira. Antiphony is a characteristic of songs of work and worship in African and African diaspora culture and are key to maintaining community. The call and response of antiphony bind us together. And so I'm going to ask you to say, os antepasados. Excellent, that's our ancestors. That's um, ancestors in Brazilian Portuguese. And the other word, ashe, is an expression that comes from Yoruba African language that means, and it means soul or light, energy, celebrations. Uh, I've been told that it's akin to the Eastern concept of chi. And uh, one mestre or capoeira master described ashe to me as the energy of an exclamation mark. And when you think of it in that way, you understand why it's difficult to translate. But combining these two words, os antepasados and ashe, really sets the stage for what I want to share with you today. In our considerations of anti-black racism in healthcare, we need to both draw from the resilience of our ancestors and correct some of the mistakes of others. So I'll ask you to repeat after me the, co the chorus or okoru. So when I sing, Ashe os antepasados, os antepasados, ashe. I'll ask you to say, Ashe os antepasados, os antepasados, ashe. Que bom está com vocês aqui nesta terra, assim conjuntos. Ache os antepasados, os antepasados, ache. Ache os antepasados, os antepasados, ache. Muito obrigado. Thank you for joining me in song, for joining me here tonight. The Yoruba say that we must begin with our ancestors, with our family and our community before all else. So I thank you for coming here to, into community with me tonight. And thank you for the opportunity to share my ideas with you. Thank you to the organizers and to my fellow speakers. I'm honored to be here and share the stage with you. And also to the caterers and the cleaners here at Hart House and to our volunteers. We appreciate you and we can't do this without you. So welcome to the Ivory Tower. By many accounts, the Ivory Tower or University Education or the Edu Business is booming. The stats are high. The University of Toronto is consistently ranked as number one in Canada, 
and we do celebrate our global reach, our research outputs, and uh, providing the best in student support. Like the healthcare centers that the university is linked with, every institution today boasts a statement on equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is the one from the University of Toronto, which believes that excellence flourishes in an environment that embraces the broadest range of people. This equitable and inclusive working and learning environment creates the conditions for diverse staff and student bodies to maximize their creativity. You know, there was a hint of sarcasm, but <laughs> indeed, I am proud to work at an institution that has given uh, deep thought to such a statement and has explicitly linked equity to excellence. But I question, how do these translate to action, particularly in our classrooms and the research environments that we are creating for our students? We must translate our words about helping people to reach their full potential into actions that critical race theorists and Indigenous scholars have been calling for literally for decades, if not centuries. We must come up with some actions that it will help us to dismantle anti-black racism and defy colonial practices. Sarah Ahmed's 2006 research on the non-performativity of anti-racism and her 2010 writings on the politics of documentation refer to these equity statements as institutional speech acts. Organizations such as universities, health clinics, hospitals, physical activity and wellness organizations may be committed to diversity and excellence and, and uh, focus on respecting and embracing the broadest range of people, but rarely do they commit explicitly to shifting the culture of anti-black racism. And this is hard work, particularly for those of us who have been socialized to support the myth of meritocracy. Anyone here raised to believe that the harder you work, the more you will earn, the better job you will get, the higher your grades will be? <clears throat> here in Canada, our dominant ideology is that we live in a fair society, that we are inclusive of all cultures, and that color doesn't matter. The most pernicious of these lies that we tell ourselves is that talking about race makes you a racist, or that naming anti-black racism and ongoing colonialism is counterproductive in this era of reconciliation or uh, post-racial times. This dominant uh, white logic, to borrow Zuberi's, Zuberi's 2011 term, ignores broader systemic inequalities, laws, policing practices, campus customs, and everyday subtle microaggressions and exclusions in our university settings, healthcare settings, and physical activity settings. Some think that naming commitments to dismantling anti-black racism and defying colonial practices are a few words too many. These words rarely appear in our EDI statements. So tonight, I want to name it. My objective here is to show that the ways that black Canadians and Torontonians specifically continue to be denied equal access to what is supposed to be universal healthcare, education, and liberties all of these should be associated with being in Toronto. I'll begin by outlining some of the central tenets and central figures of critical race theory. The fundamental premise is that society is a racially stratified and unequal place where power processes systematically disenfranchise oppressed people. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois Du Bois, the first African American to earn a doctorate from Harvard University, became a key figure in shifting discussions of race from biological understandings of different groups to sociological explorations of the after effects of enslavement of Africans in the United States. He protested against lynching, segregation laws, and discrimination in education and employment. And he wrote, we must complain, tense, plain, blunt complaint, ceaseless agitation, unfailing exposure of dishonesty and wrong. This is the ancient unerring way to liberty and we must follow it. He did not see another way around the racial stratification of the United States, a country that was founded on the idea of men being created equal. And we get so much of our critical race theory from the United States but we have the same issues 
here. Building on this legacy, Dr. Tarek Albert Bell, a lawyer and civil rights activist, was the first tenured African-American professor of law at Harvard Law School. According to the website that's devoted to his scholarship, when he joined the faculty of Harvard Law in 1969, Professor Bell brought his experience in and reflections on the civil rights movement and racial inequality to the center of his teaching and scholarship. This was a first. For example, education was one of the most important applications of his work, where in 1976 he controversially argued in his article published in the Yale Law Review that the prevailing views about school desegregation and practices such as desegregated busing were failing to improve the lives of black children and were contrary to the wishes of many black communities. They were much more interested in obtaining quality schools than integrated ones. His community recognized the connection between education, socioeconomic status, and health outcomes. So here we have one of the first principles of critical race theory, that you must listen to the voices and the stories of the oppressed. He recognized that the rhetoric of a colorblind or level playing field, a race neutral society, or a liberal meritocracy actually works to hide racial inequalities and it must be challenged. Said differently, he describes racism as a permanent feature of our culture, one that must be open, openly challenged. In 1990, there were no African American women among the tenured faculty in his department at uh, Harvard Law. This was a dearth that Bell decided to protest with an unpaid leave of absence. He clearly showed his ability to put his body and his livelihood on the line for a theoretical orientation that demands action and transformation. This is another of his principles, and it builds directly from Du Bois's demands that we must come plain. One of the most significant elements to also emerge from Harvard Law was Bell's student Kimberly Crenshaw, who's already been mentioned this morning and probably will be mentioned again, or this evening. <laughs> She's celebrated for coining the term intersectionality. And uh, I want to just spend a moment here to clarify its origins. So Crenshaw's work on race and the law points to a landmark case at General Motors, where black women felt that they were being excluded from jobs, but were challenged to prove their discrim the, the discrimination against their group. There were jobs held by women, but they were white women. And there were jobs held by blacks, but they were black men. According to the employment law of the time, the company could not be proven to be exclusionary because they were employing women and they were employing blacks. But black women understood the limitations that they were facing, that they were both about gender and race at the same time. So this idea of the intersection is valuable to us because it captures the way that we are not only characterized by one element of our identities. And you've already seen a beautiful graphic that highlights the many different ways that we show up and all of those intersections need to be taken into account. Not only our oppressions, but also our privileges. So Kimberly Crenshaw adds intersectionality to provide five main tenets of critical race theory. But these tenets uh, did not just emerge in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s. These tenets really stand on the shoulders of our academic ancestors. The origins of anti-black racism, in order to understand those origins, we need to trace all the way back to the 1600s and the transatlantic triangle of trade that involved the enslavement of adults and children. So I also want to draw your attention a bit further north. Quite often when you see these maps, Canada is excluded. But let's not forget the dispossession of indigenous lands on Turtle Island, or what we now call North America, as well as the Caribbean islands and uh, South America. That dispossession of land was a necessary prerequisite for the enslavement of Africans to work on the land, in the homes, and in the businesses of European settlers. This triangle of trade with the raw goods set being sent to Europe and the manufactured goods being sent back to uh, many uh, regions in Africa and then again back to North and South America 
demanded the inhumane treatment of workers. And this could only be justified if they were stripped of their humanity. During the 18th century, European scientists went to work using craniometry, which is skull measurements, and phrenology, personality brain maps, in order to draw conclusions between various physical measurements of the skull, facial angles, size and shape of maxillary and frontal bones, drawing connections between these bones and intelligence, morality, beauty. And it was common for these measurements to demonstrate that it was the white and European peoples that were intellectually and morally superior, and of course, more beautiful. Through the practice, though the practice of craniometry and phrenology has been mocked, even at its zenith, it also heavily influenced many of our policies and institutions in the 19th century, from education to law and to health. And as we see today, it continues to be used to discredit, stereotype, and exclude black people. I want to be very clear that there's no biological basis for this distinction between people. Race is a concept that signifies and symbolizes socio-political conflicts and interests in reference to different types of human bodies. Yet race is a significant social determinant of health. Black people are dispro disproportionately negatively affected by racism. So what I'll outline for you with the time that I have remaining is five ways that anti-racism continues to contribute to ill health. I'll talk about daily microaggressions, the lack of research, limited access, socioeconomic discrimination, and the ways our intersectional identities are ignored. So we've already talked a little bit about microaggressions, the subtle slights that communicate prejudice and hostility, but I wanted to share with you the case of John River to uh, really bring it home. This award-winning Canadian, or sorry, award-nominated Canadian rapper walked into a GTA hospital in December 2017 complaining about shortness of breath and severe headaches. He reported feeling stereotyped, abused, abused, assaulted, dismissed, and humiliated by the healthcare system because they told him that he must be imagining the pain. And he was returning day after day, moving between multiple hosp hospitals, but they said that he was faking his symptoms in order to get narcotics. Meanwhile, he was in excruciating pain that could have been relieved with a simple surgery. And members of his community who were familiar with the conscious and unconscious biases that exist in Canada's healthcare sent him some advice. When you go to the hospital, don't wear a hoodie. We know that black women in Canada are under screened for certain diseases such as cervical and breast cancer, even though evidence from the United States and the United Kingdom indicates that black women may be predisposed to worse outcomes from the disease. The fact that there's little to no healthcare data or research that's specific to blacks is a direct result of our colorblind, meritocratic, and fair ideology that assumes that everyone is treated the same. If we just do research on women, the assumption is that that's good enough. But after decades of listening to the voices and stories of the oppressed group, we finally have some data. And thanks to Onye No Rom, pictured here in the center, Nakia Lifun on the right, and Aisha Lofters on the left, along with their colleagues, we now have the research to show that not everyone is treated the same. And the next step is to do something about it. When we consider the issue of limited access, it's not only the screening tools or surgical procedures that black people might need that they don't get. We know that there are low numbers of uh, black doctors relative to the number of black people in Toronto. And this of course is related to medical school opportunities, undergraduate school opportunities, high school opportunities and so on. So the, the idea that this is a systemic problem also needs to account for the many generations of change that need to take place. We also know that uh, black people don't see themselves represented in fitness studios. There are, I dare say, dozens of yoga studios in Toronto. But we know that black women in particular have uh, indicated that they don't always feel comfortable in those spaces. So where can they go to do yoga? 
uh, the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants wants to be leaders in helping people both confront their biases and learn how they can make our city an inclusive and prosperous place for everyone. And so they created this uh, advertisement that you see on the right to explicitly draw attention to the discrimination that is involved in renting and hiring black folks. They don't create racism by calling it out. They help us to think about how it manifests and what we might do to change the system. Ignoring our intersections contributes to ill health because black people face discrimination unevenly. Black women face different types of gender-based violence than black men. And for black women, discrimination because of faith, age, pregnancy, mixed race identity, citizenship status, and of course I could go on, uh, means that they experience the world differently. I'm sometimes asked, asked why do we need to say anti-black racism? Can't we just say racism? And in fact, I would go the other way and say, even saying anti-black racism is not going far enough because it is, as it has already been pointed out by one of our participants here, black, the black community is diverse. And so we need to do more investigations to understand what kind of intersections and what kinds of racism different black people are experiencing. To highlight another question I get asked, is it racist to concern ourselves with black people specifically? The answer to that, I hope by the end of my talk, you understand is no. And if racism is systemic, is there anything that I can do to change it? Well, the answer to that is a resounding yes. One of my intellectual mentors, Dr. Njoki Wayne at the University of Toronto's Ontario Institute for Studies in Education asks whether we can shift our ways of being to decolonize this place. And I know many of you are doing really good work and there's already much, uh, and there is much more to be done. But just uh, to draw from some of her principles, she says that in order to decolonize this place, we must acknowledge the disease of anti-black racism and recognizing that that is a problem of colonization, a problem of capitalism, a problem of um, destroying our environment as well. Can we authentically show up and can we align or ally with each other? I don't have time to go into uh, the different research projects that I'm doing around physical activity and um, health, particularly for black communities, but I'll just say that so many of my participants have um, have emphasized the need to be able to participate in uh, anti-oppressive space. And that does not necessarily mean a black only space, but sometimes it does. And participating in physical activity is an opportunity for them to protect their mental health as well as, well as their physical health by being in a safe environment. So I'll close now by asking you to turn to the person beside you and tell them, I see you, I know you, you are me. Tansy, hello. Um, the bar's been set pretty high. Um, we've uh, been up for uh, about 50 minutes now, um, but I want to um, acknowledge um, the space that's been created tonight. Um, I want to um, acknowledge Dr. Bishop and Shannon and all of the helpers for getting us all together and organizing this event. Um, and uh, I want to acknowledge our panel. I want to thank um, Ritika and Janelle. Janelle, thanks for calling the ancestors in. That helps. Um, I, like others, um, often start off with a land acknowledgement, um, but that's been done. Um, but I also um, follow a protocol around self-location. Um, so I put up that picture of the prairies, um, and I did a bad job with my bio, I think, though um, I'm excited. I have six kids and three granddaughters. Um, but uh, yeah, that is a piece of the prairie, so there might be some people that know Saskatchewan Prairie a little bit, and I have a relationship with that land. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the um, land where my uh, Miti maternal kin lines come um, most recently. Um, and I've spent time on that land, getting to know that land, even though, um, yeah, I haven't spent, um, I was born outside of that land and, and raised mostly outside of that land. So that's actually um, 
uh, road that goes to a communal pasture. And then if you follow the road around the bend, you get to like a place along the Saskatchewan River, which was a historic uh, Métis uh, wintering place. And I've picked medicine on that land. If you look really closely, you can uh, see the sagebrush. And I'm to acknowledge um, all of my teachers as well. Um, so that's the piece I've added onto the bio and my, my ceremony lodge. Those things are just as important as all my degrees, maybe more important. So they're actually listed up front on my CV now. So I'm gonna try to do four things. Um, maybe that's ambitious, um, but uh, yeah, I felt really inspired as we were working um, on our discussions um, over the last couple of days. So I wanna reflect a little bit on the current social value of health services for First Nations Inuit, Métis, um, urban Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, I want to talk about imagining where we want to be, and that's for all of us, because that imagining, um, I think, is um, going to be critical to where we want to go. Um, there's been a lot said already about racism. Um, we talk specifically about anti-Indigenous racism, and again, um, even that isn't sufficient. Um, so I'm Métis, um, so there's specific forms of anti-Métis racism. I say sometimes racism like is like Baskin-Robbins. Unfortunately, there's a lot of different flavors of it, um, and it not only, um, yeah, varies depending on the racialized group. Um, there's all different kinds of things like um, attitudinal and systemic and epistemic racism. Um, but it is a key driver of the persistent barriers to health services of social value for Indigenous people. And that's kind of the elephant in the room. So here we are um, in like uh, this nation state called Canada um, and uh, we feel good about the fact that we have health access for all. I work at an institution that um, says that they are going to provide quality care for all, um, but the elephant in the room is we're not even talking about racism and how it is as important as poverty, at least for indigenous peoples, um, but I believe probably as important for other racialized um, peoples, including um, people who are racialized as black. Um, with respect to actually life or death um, and uh, barriers and access to healthcare. And then I always have four actions. So some of it will be repeated. I'm kind of a layered thinker. I'm probably maybe one of the older people up here tonight, which is really weird because I um, started my medical career when I was quite young. So the joke was I was Doogie Hauser's half-breed sister, so yeah, maybe that's a bad joke, but we have this trickster character, so we're allowed to say that, and if you need to take me aside, um, yeah, let me know. I think I've made the joke. It'll be my elders that I'll be most accountable to, but we think laughter is good medicine too, okay? So, so this is interesting, though. Why is it that um, like Indigenous infants, First Nations, Inuit infants are still two to four times more likely to die right, in this affluent country of Canada, right, compared to the general um, population. And of course, infant mortality rate um, being a representation of broader community health, like a, so, and what have our responses been? So there's this narrative actually that, um, I guess I started my early research career trying to interrupt, um, and I've been, I think that's the Lancet. So that's the second time I got published in a journal actually trying to disrupt a narrative um, which comes out of our um, Health Canada um, saying that actually there's been an improvement in Indigenous infant mortality rates in the country um, where there hasn't actually been any improvement um, over the past uh, couple of decades anyways. But there's incorrect infant mortality statistics. So Janelle hinted at, and we've got to talk more because I'm really passionate about um, this masking of inequities. And like uh, there's a real colonial... Um, drive to the fact that we don't actually ask about race and ethnicity. You know, we're too good in Canada. We don't have that racism that's in the South. But then what happens um, is this systemic racism and inequitable distribution of health and social resources persists. And then there's lies um, that it doesn't. Um, so, and then um, this picture, and again, see, I changed my slides up a little bit. I was inspired. So does anybody know what that white building is up in the corner? Some of you know, right? We've got some 
doctors here. Okay, so who knows here that in Canada we actually had an apartheid health system. So early on in my medical career, and actually that building, if you go there, leaders of family medicine across the country have been in that building, right? So when I went up to Northwestern Ontario as a medical student, I worked in that building. That's the old Sioux Lookout Zone Hospital. There's been two um, hunger strikes in that hospital, one by a... Um, indigenous physician and one by First Nations leaders, right? So when I went up there, and so, and this has only changed in the last 10 years, in this town there was two hospitals in the town of Sioux Lookout. This hospital, which actually was an old TB sanatorium, um, was the hospital where the First Nations people um, from Northwestern Ontario could go to. Um, and then there was another hospital that the mostly settler population of the town could go to. Okay, and then we have my institution, St. Michael's Hospital, just down the street there, um, providing quality health services for all, right? So, um, but why wouldn't we even know about this, right? Like, uh, you know, there was a lot of activism, like uh, in my early university days about apartheid in South Africa, right? But you could look, you could look, I would love to do this if there's any bright researchers just at the demographics in a city like Saskatoon or Winnipeg, right? Um, and look at the distribution of where people live. There's lines in that town of Saskatoon um, that uh, show um, like uh, segregation and, and racial segregation. It's an indigenous settler segregation. Um, this um, cartoon I show lots of times and I, um, I'm not tired of it yet, but I think it's important then, um, even though it comes from law, right? So it's a cartoon about a very important um, legal case, the Dalgamuk decision. Um, it's the first time in a Canadian court of law um, where indigenous knowledge of the land um, was actually um, respected as a valid source of knowledge. Right? But what I see when I look at the picture, you see the book knowledge, right? So these are knowledge systems, right? And so then this is about the privileging of one kind of knowledge over another. But it's something I think about all the time. And actually, maybe some of my panelists are doing a little better because I'm standing up here talking, right? With a, like a slide set, right? Like, so um, yeah, we got to get some conversations going. But I, yeah, I do like to talk a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to uh, try to make up for uh, some uh, imbalance in uh, voice and audience that uh, might be ongoing in certain spheres of my life. Okay, but then you look at the image, so there's somebody who looks like an indigenous person, an elder maybe, um, but that even then, the cartoonist isn't able to represent the sophistication of that knowledge system. So even then, you could say, if you were critically looking at it, that there's a simplicity to that knowledge. But here we are in the ivory tower, right? So what do we do, right? So that gets perpetuated. What was I trained to do as a family doctor? What did I do in my clinic, you know, at lunch hour, right? Like, what kinds of resources was I drawing on? So... See, this is a thing that we need to continually try to disrupt, particularly at universities and in faculties of health sciences. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a tricky one, but something to keep in mind. Um, so just because I don't have a lot of time, there's some uh, intersections. But I guess, um, yeah, I think that um, you can make a fairly compelling case that health and social services are typically of limited indigenous social value. And if we look at things um, like the um, National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, and this was the final um, like uh, community event, the closing of Walking With My Sisters, which is a beautiful um, community initiative um, that collected moccasin vamps um, from friends and family members of lost loved ones. And it was set up as a ceremony. That's my lodge sister, Christy Belcourt. Um, and that's going down to that Saskatchewan River again, right? And then, of course, um, we have the story of Mr. Sinclair, right? But again, another critical pitfall is people say, well, this is the tip of the iceberg, right? Like, and I think uh, you'll hear from Stephanie pretty soon. Um, and uh, when we were reflecting on those exercises, um, she pointed out that, like, she hears as well as I hear, oh, well, that's the exception. That's only, you know, that hit the newspaper. But people forget that that could be happening every day, right? So I try to think about that in my clinical work all the time, right? Um, and I think, well, actually, um, somebody could be misdiagnosed and dying 
like every day, and I could be privy to that, right? That's kind of like my little test I have. There was, when I did Rural Emerge, um, I had uh, teaching, you know, smileys, things you can never miss in Emerge, right? But now this is a new test when we think about social positioning, right? Like always critically reflecting and thinking, am I being privy, right, to some kind of faulty logic, right, where I'm misdiagnosing social position and uh, it's resulting in ill harm. So we need some new models. Okay, so new models, so this is like uh, just, I'm only on item number two and we're up to like 10 minutes, but that's okay, I can talk really fast. Um, so setting a generative course, but this just gets to the imagining and I think we've already been inspired, um, Janelle is quite inspired by like the singing and the movement. So we think about because there is a rich diversity like of sophisticated knowledge systems like that can help the whole world like approach health and well-being and deal with global warming like why would you exclude indigenous voices right from how to deal with climate change right like i guess when you look at people lived on the land that's the irony when i show that slide of the elder with that kind of um oversimplified representation of their knowledge of the land. It's like, well, you know, if I end up in the middle of the Saskatchewan Prairie in a snowstorm, like, what do I want? The Cochrane Collaborative, right? Or do I want anybody that knows how to live there? Well, we're kind of in the middle of a snowstorm, right? But uh, it's a storm, it's called global warming. So why don't we ask the people? I was, um, I had the opportunity to work with some colleagues um, in Hawaii at the time of the tsunami, right? And like, so yeah, I walked my talk. I was like, well, I went to go see somebody in the community that I knew um, who was a Hawaiian, right? Because I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna do local knowledge. Like I had friends, they just wanted to take the van and drive it up the mountain and we had a disagreement. I said, no, I'm gonna go to that Hawaiian family that we've gotten connected with. They live kind of in the foothills and I'm gonna do what they, they, they say to do, right? Because they know how to deal with tsunamis just like in Newfoundland, I guess they know how to deal with snowstorms. There's beautiful concepts in languages and just very briefly, this concept that was gifted to me by um, grandmother uh, Madeline Dion Stout who's um, on my side of that picture, and then there's Jan Longboat and Carol Terry. Carol Terry just arriving this evening because she's going to help us uh, talk a whole bunch about health data and health data revolution um, tomorrow. Um, but uh, this uh, concept of aniskastastawin, attachment through the ages where all people and things are connected. What if we had health services like that, right? So that strength of our social relationships and social fabric, right? That's like social capital 4.0, right? Um, and uh, my auntie tells me I, I'm only beginning to understand it. So we're doing two things, right? And that's why I have this approach B here highlighted. And I had the opportunity and the responsibility to share information as an expert witness at the National Inquiry for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirit People. And I asked community members and my elders what I should do and they said, well, give them something strength-based, right? Because we got to have some kind of balance even to stay sane in this room, right? So we need both, right? So you could dig into what is wrong with colonial systems and within our own communities as a result of colonial systems and fight to change the system and seek restitution. So we got to do that. But we got to spend time dancing, moving with our ancestors and remembering that the more time I'm spending in an ivory tower like this, the uh, more disconnected I'm getting from what will actually work on the ground, right? I can hold space. I try to hold space in a hospital, right? I'll listen. I've got those uh, quotes to inspire me. It can be tough doing that, and I want to mention that in a minute, right? But the answers lie in our communities, right? So why strength-based? Because we are who we imagine ourselves to be, and the greatest of gifts is to imagine ourselves richly, and that's Native American writer Scott S. Momaday, okay? So just for 30 seconds or so, can you imagine thriving Indigenous communities, right? And so those are two of my six children, um, and uh, someday I can tell you a little bit more about um, the pathway like in my life and as um, I go through and the impacts of colonization and also strong and amazing, mostly women, 
um, who have set the way for me to stand up here and be a proud and grounded Métis woman. Um, but uh, this is at my son uh, Jay and Quinn's Cree naming ceremony, right? So we got to imagine thriving communities. But if you can't imagine a thriving Indigenous community, why is that? Okay, so colonization is an underlying determinant of health. We've talked about that. Um, but actually, when Michael Marmot was working on his report on the social determinants of health, Indigenous people were mentioned 11 times in the report. I wanted a chapter, but... Um, I think we might have had one text box, okay? But Indigenous people did get together internationally and met in Melbourne, and they said everyone agrees there's one critical determinant of health, the effect of colonization, not poverty, okay? They're linked, okay? And then the Mari, where they do study and look at racialization and discrimination in New Zealand, right? If we adjust for both discrimination and poverty, then we see these cross-cutting um, inequities in health comes, outcomes disappear. So, um, yes, yeah, someone's gonna help me b get better with my PowerPoint. Maybe it'll be my sons, they promised. They were quite impressed when I said they could make a better PowerPoint than me. But here you see, just for the non-data people, right? Like, these things mean that Maori are having worse health outcomes, right, than New Zealanders of European ancestry. But then when you get over here, the numbers go down and uh, these confidence intervals cross once. So they disappear, right? So we just have to get rid of poverty and racism. But I, I would agree that it's permanent. Okay. So I'm going to go fast on this because we've heard about it. So this is basically what some people have already said, like about differential access to quality of health care. One of the things I'm really concerned about is um, like non-adherence to clinical practice guidelines. Um, and uh, we're doing some work to actually um, further identify and study that. So um, what I'll be, the basic theme here, right, is racism is a permanent installation, right, like of our brains. That's a sad kind of emerging human fact, right, though if we looked at any society around the world, um, maybe there was some concept. We in-group and out-group based on whether or not um, we look at a person and decide if they're similar to us or not. That's a terrible, tragic human condition, right? It's, um, but the good news is we can do something about it, right? And when I started looking at this area, I actually was discouraged. I thought it's all done by w the time we're six, right? But you can actually get a bit better. But a lot of it's happening at an unconscious level. And we could have a big debate about why it's happening. I'm less interested in that. I'm kind of utilitarian. I just want to be able to deal with it, okay? The other piece, though, is it's constantly getting reinforced, particularly for Indigenous um, peoples and people who are racialized as black in this country, right? So I um, showed you the picture earlier encouraging you to think about thriving Indigenous communities. So if you had trouble doing that, right, um, yeah, don't feel like it's completely your fault because it's being reinforced 24-7 in the media. So the story behind this slide is actually, it was a screenshot that the CBC used when they were profiling children's dental health across racialized communities. So this was a screenshot that they showed for the Indigenous communities, which of course um, is a shot around um, some of the um, community actions that took place when there was a um, violent confrontation around fracking between Indigenous people um, and the police um, in New Brunswick. But actually what you didn't see on the CBC was the way that the elders got roughed around and arrested the night before. So none of them are good behaviors, right? But the fact that this particular image was reinforced. Um, I don't like rushing the story of Brian Sinclair um, but if you want to look at this report, this is a good one because it was actually prepared with the family, right? But basically, this is a good example about how social positioning gets misdiagnosed in emergency room context. And we hear it over and over and over again, right? Um, and it happens in every emergency room across this country um, so that people come in. Mr. Sinclair, I actually think he was killed with a bit of kindness in there. Right? I don't believe 100, over 100 healthcare people woke up and said, I'm going to kill someone like, um, based on their social positioning today. Everybody, so this is the key piece here, the key teaching piece is, I think, the most dangerous 
part of anti-Indigenous racism actually um, is happening like at a non-explicit, maybe unconscious level. We can make a conscious choice here, though, to retrain our brains, okay? Um, so more data here um, in urban context just about how frequent this experience of discrimination is. So we have to make up our own studies because the systems are masking these disparities. Don't forget there's 70,000 Indigenous people living in the city of Toronto, more than Northern Ontario, so you don't need to go up to Northern Ontario um, to uh, help address um, health inequities. They're in your practices. Um, our most recent data um, says that there are about one out of five of the total volume of patients in St. Mike's Emerge, more than 10% of the inpatients. These studies have been published. Why is it taking so long for this news to spread? That's an interesting question. Okay, but now we've done this, our Health Counts Respondent Driven Sampling Study, like in five cities across the province, so it's a cohort of over 2,500. Like in, on average, about one in four Indigenous people experience discrimination in the healthcare system um, over the past five years. Um, and we know that's underreported, right? Um, so this notion that there's unintentional, implicit racist assumptions and behaviors that are the most common and most harmful life-threatening in health services. Um, so that's a hypothesis. I'm not going to get into IAT just to say that. Um, like uh, what we're talking about then is the fact that um, unconsciously we're in-grouping and out-grouping but it actually translates into our behaviors and the treatment. So in this study, right, and the large majority of physicians have this race preference bias, right? So we've made an indigenous white IAT. Um, and actually when I did it, like I had like a mild to moderate indigenous race preference bias. Do I think that's moral? Do I think that's correct? No, right? Why do I have it? Don't know. Mom, Indigenous dad, white, so maybe I spent more time with my mom than my dad um, when some of my social preferences were forming, right? Um, but do I have it? Yes. So then can I be aware of it and deal with it? So, and that's the thing, it goes across racialized groups. The classic ones were black, white, IATs, and, but across racialized groups, there was a pro-white race preference, except for the black docs, right? Who had a black race preference. So again, just a bit more evidence. Um, do people want to just, um, I got a bit rushed, maybe you're just thinking Smiley had too many slides for a limited time and you're tired of sitting, um, but uh, yeah, do you want to just uh, chat with your neighbor for a minute about how you're feeling with some of this information that has been shared so far? This idea of being able to sit with our discomfort and learn from it, so I'll encourage people to think about that, yeah. Um, but let me just talk about a couple actions. How many people here have read the TRC report? Yeah, okay. It's tough reading. Um, you can kind of be a witness. Um, I think that it's impossible, actually, um, for people over the age probably of maybe 15, 16, right, who were educated in Canada, and then if people are coming from outside of Canada, it's quite unusual for people to have gotten kind of a succinct actual factual history about Indigenous history through the voices of Indigenous people. Um, so, but I encourage you to kind of get a buddy to read it, but uh, that's one thing you can do. Okay, this exercise, um, maybe we can come back to it, but we can actually retrain our brains. So remember I said I'd given up on um, like the fact that we could actually deal with this. So I was like feeling pretty bad about 10 years ago, right, when I started like listening to some of the um, like emerging psychology um, discussion, like around like in grouping and out grouping um, and implicit association. And again, it's a complex field. I've way oversimplified it. Um, but then my colleague Ian Parody sent me this study by Patricia Devine and Will Cox. We've actually changed, we're running a trial right now at St. Mike's and we've indigenized this study, right? So they're just trying to help people like address um, like uh, race preference bias. And it's very interesting. What's interesting about this slide, I think, is when you take concepts that actually I think are present in many societies and civilizations around the world, this idea of individuating, right, um, 
I think about um, don't judge a book by its cover, perspective taking, walking in someone else's shoes and moccasins. Some are a little fancier, right? Like uh, stereotype replacement. So that's like what I call the Janet Smiley subway exercise. Um, I have an active imagination. I get on the subway and I start making up stories about people and then I start checking myself and thinking, okay, Janet, it's a bit stereotyped, right? So it's interesting because I'll often use the example of my own class privilege. I think it's less painful than for me to talk about my own kind of internalized, right? And then external racism. Um, but uh, yeah, I might decide that somebody is poorer than I am. And then I also make the second faulty assumption that maybe um, they're less happy than I am because they have less money than I am. So both of those things are very likely, well, the first one, you don't know, right? And then the second one, yeah, just because somebody might have less money um, doesn't make them less happy than me at that particular time. So if there's time um, and some of you took pictures, you can look up that article by Divine or um, I'm happy to share the slides. You can try to pick one of those strategies. Um, there is Indigenous cultural safety programming. There's like tons now. So we're actually studying and trying to think about what would be most useful. I think as a starter, having one that's professionally facilitated, interactive, and actually has an anti-racist focus, right? Because it can be very nice to read a book, right? And, you know, we can move people through the arts. Um, but yeah, I think I love my own um, like Cree Métis cultural teachings and stories. But yeah, if you're seeing them like uh, through a warped and distorted lens, right? Um, then um, perhaps you're not um, going to benefit as much, right? If something's feeling easy and good and fun, it's not usually really helping address this painful reality of bias um, and oppression. So the last little piece I just wanted to say, and I've been thinking a lot about leadership because of course, um, like uh, we often think about people who are like coming into health services, very ill and vulnerable places like emergency room departments, um, which are real hot spots. Um, but one of the things I've noticed, I guess as um, I've supposedly advanced a little bit perhaps in my research career, um, is it does seem um, that um, there can be um, more microaggressions, um, more like just uh, what I think are, um, yeah, direct aggressions. Um, and I think about this because I guess perhaps then the threat is um, stronger or something because now apparently I have some more research credentials. Um, so. Yeah, I want people to think about Jody Wilson-Raybould, and of course you have her with Jane Philpott. I also think then perhaps as, like, um, yeah, and I have, like, as I perhaps have more power, right, like within an institution like U of T, right, like uh, as a senior research chair um, and uh, full professor. Um, but, yeah, and then there becomes... Uh, more opportunity, I guess, to share like differences in worldviews and values, right? I come from a very um, value-based culture um, and I've been trained as an Indigenous leader now for um, quite a long time. Um, so I guess I just think about promoting Indigenous leadership and what that really takes and for promoting diversity in leadership. So it's just something for us to think about because I actually think some people like uh, it might be easier to be in the conversation. I would say it for myself if it was a more junior colleague or a student or my patients, right? Like um, I think I'm maybe more aware of my power and privilege, right? Um, but if it's around a more senior table, right? Like or um, the person maybe um, yeah, is now competing with me, um, yeah, I think it can um, be quite different. So for those of you in senior leadership positions, think about that and think about if you're feeling uncomfortable. Um, the most common stereotypes of Indigenous women in leadership positions um, is that they are abrasive um, and angry. Okay, um, so yeah, think about that if you're listening to an Indigenous woman in a senior leadership position or at a meeting and they appear abrasive and angry, um, maybe just think about why that might happen. Um, and I think it, the other piece about it, and I have um, like uh, Dr. Bryden to thank for this. I think if you see a racialized person 
um, who appears angry and perhaps disruptive, um, and you're trying, you're in some kind of um, leadership position, um, and it's being um, identified as a problem, right? I think that's quite a different situation than if you have just an angry, disruptive physician, right? Like uh, who may not be in a socially excluded position or might not only might not be the only person in the room, right? Like uh, most of the time, right? And not who might not have the same pressures or responsibilities, like in terms of voicing inequities. So it might feel a little dis, um, uncomfortable and maybe they might take up a little bit more time, but I would think that the mechanisms to deal with that, to make sure that things can keep going on in a good way would be quite different, right? Than a non-reflective, like a person who wasn't experiencing like attacks um, of oppression um, and responsibility. Okay, so uh, that's it for me. And uh, I've stolen a little bit of time from uh, Stephanie Nixon, um, but uh, I'll let the facilitators deal with that. <laughs> Perfect. There's two logistical issues we need to attend to. And the first is that for this session, you're gonna need a paper and a pen. There's papers coming down. You may recall pens, the, we write with pens. Uh, and the second is that when I say go, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to move your body in a way that just makes your body feel better. You have been sitting still for so long. Get air into you and then settle however feels comfortable, including if you want to stand, go. And now find your way to a comfortable position. What is comfortable for you now? Is it sitting? Is it standing? Is it sitting on a different side of the table? Take a couple deep breaths. Fill up your mind with air. Every single one of you has had a long day. And here you are doing this important work for hours at the end of it. So a moment of self-appreciation, self-compassion. And here we go. I've had the opportunity to attend quite a number of talks on racism in the context of health and healthcare. I've never been at or even heard of a talk on whiteness in the context of health or healthcare or health education. And the thing is, I'm not just at a talk on whiteness, I'm actually giving the talk on whiteness. And so I want to frame my remarks as an invitation. In fact, what I'm going to do is not talk about whiteness, I'm going to talk about my whiteness. I'm going to reflect critically on what my journey has been and where I'm heading in terms of coming to understand what it means to be white and where this fits into the stories of racism and anti-oppression that have been so beautifully introduced by my panelists, co-panelists. So I'm speaking to everyone today uh, in the room and joining us online. And there are some times in this conversation when I'm speaking in particular to my white colleagues. And I am accountable in these remarks to my black and indigenous and racialized colleagues on this panel, to the black and indigenous racialized folks in the room and online. That is the role of white folks in anti-racist work, is accountability to our BIPOC partners. And so when I make a mistake, not if, right? This is fraught work. I'm getting into the weeds here. There will be mistakes. And when I make missteps, I am accountable to you. I uh, will welcome you to let me know. I will apologize and I will pledge to understand it and do better. So let's begin. 
I found out I was white when I was 28 years old. It was in a social determinants of health class in my Master of Science program. Our professor asked us to consider what are the social factors that have shaped our health. And I listened to my classmates, and, and one person said I, it was my being a new immigrant to this country, another person said it was being black, another said it was being South Asian. It got around to my turn, and I just felt so embarrassed. Uh, and I said, this actually, this exercise doesn't really apply to me. You see, I, I'm not anything, I'm just normal. Now, I grew up in a white middle-class household in a largely white neighborhood in Scarborough of parents of Irish and English descent. I, it was a socially progressive household, a colorblind household. And I had four years of a kinesiology undergraduate degree. I had trained in physiotherapy at a school known for its critical thinking, and I had practiced clinically for four years at this point at the late, great Wellesley Hospital with the HIV program, one of the most socially progressive hospitals in the city. And then I was here. And the students and the teacher around me helped to nudge me to think that I'm not nothing. Uh, that uh, I'm many things, uh, including white, and that that matters. And when I look back at my 28-year-old self, I can see now why I thought I was nothing. And it's because I had this understanding of racism that is completely wrong. I thought that racism was something that only happened between individuals, that was only perpetrated by people who were bad, and was something that was done on purpose. Years later, I have come to see that the mere idea that I could see myself as normal reflects a profound position of superiority, such that my whiteness, my social, social position was taken as the default, as the normal way of being against which everything else was different, and not just different, but inferior. I now understand my whiteness as the top of a coin. This is a figure from a paper I published last month called The Coin Model of Privilege and Critical Allyship. And it's one more model, in addition to some that you've been introduced to already, for getting our heads around how we might understand our positions of unearned advantage and how they are linked to systems of inequality. So I picture now a coin, the coin metaphor, being the social structure with its historic uh, roots that gives unearned advantage if your social identity is aligned with it or unearned disadvantage if you don't. We are all socialized into these coins. We don't get to opt out of them. We are all socialized into them. And in fact, even though you receive privilege on the top and oppression on the bottom, we are all socialized and therefore we are all potentially upholding, re reinforcing these coins. And so for racism, I understand now my social identity of being white. I did not ask to be white. I am white. I did not ask to fall into this history. I am in this history. And what I need to come to see is how I am engaged in these historic patterns. And of course, it's not just racism, right? It's intersecting with a whole bunch of other coins, some of which I'm on the top of, some of which I received unearned advantage from, and some unearned disadvantage. But fundamentally, I understand racism as structural. And so here's where I want you to take your page, the paper that you found for yourself, and draw a line down the middle of it, just like I've got a line down the middle here. And I want us think, to think about these competing definitions of racism. And the first is this idea, 28-year-old me, understanding racism as occurring between individuals. It's something that bad people do. It's something that's done intentionally. And I want you to take a moment to brainstorm with me around this question. If that's how I understand racism, then what reactions will logically follow for a white person like me who is given the feedback that their behavior was racist? If I believe that racism is something that happens between individuals, it's done by bad people, and it's intentional, and I'm told, I've given, been given feedback that my racism, uh, pardon me, that my behavior was racist, write down three feelings that would logically follow. What are three feelings I might have? And now write down two behaviors. What might I do? Two behaviors that logically follow from these feelings.
And if I have those feelings and they lead to these behaviors, write down one statement that I might make to the person who had given me the feedback that my actions were racist. I've been told my actions were racist. If that's how I felt and that's how I behaved, what's one thing I might say to that person? And now the final part of this arc. What is the function of these feelings and behaviors and statements? What do they do? What is the effect of these feelings and statements on me, the person who has received that feedback, and on racism? What does it make possible or impossible? And we're gonna walk through this, and the way that we're gonna do this is that I'm gonna ask you and you are gonna tell your answer to the person across the table and it's gonna be so nice and fast. You're gonna love this. So let's try it out with feelings. And so what is the effect, and stay with me on this one, what is the effect for that person, for me, who's received that feedback and what is the effect for racism? It shuts down the conversation, doesn't it? It limits any possibility for me to learn more about my own racial position. It fundamentally protects racism. It ensures the status quo. What is this constellation of feelings and behaviors and statements commonly called? <laughs> this is a, co a term coined by Robin DiAngelo, a white American academic to describe the constellation of feelings and behaviors and actions that are deployed by white folks to shut down any possibility of change when it comes to racism, to ensure the status quo. In fact, she goes on further to say, although white fragility is triggered by discomfort and anxiety, it's born of superiority and entitlement. White fragility is not weakness. It's a powerful means of white racial control and the protection of white advantage. Now to my white colleagues in the audience, the hegemonic power of white fragility is so strong that it actually closes down any engagement around white fragility, yeah? Until we can see it. Now, we know that those responses are based on an understanding of racism that is completely wrong. It's completely erroneous. We know that racism is structural. It's something we are all socialized into from birth. The question is not whether I'm racist, it's how I'm racist every single day. And the goal is for me to, as a white person, is for me to have my privilege, my position, my participation in upholding white supremacy illuminated so I can stop doing it. And so if that's my understanding of racism, then what are four, three feelings I might have if someone gives me feedback that my behavior was racist? Go, write it down, three feelings. <coughs> And if I have those feelings, what are two behaviors I might have? What are two things I might do? What follows logically? If the goal is to have my privilege illuminated, I feel this way and what might I do? And what's one thing I might say to the person who just offered me that feedback? And what is the effect on me? What is made possible for me? And what is, what is the effect on racism? In addition to the brilliant answers you just wrote down, here's how I'm thinking about this that the feelings that will naturally follow from your gratitude, often discomfort, certainly humility, and a lot of the time, the more I can get my head around this motivation. It's like, oh, thank you. Now I can change, oh, I can see that better. Okay, yes, one step further on my journey. And it'll lead to a, uh, behaviors like, I'm sorry. Like, I believe you. 
I don't totally understand it yet, but I believe you, and I would like to, to understand this better. Processing, reflection. And it'll lead to statements like, thank you. I have work to do. Like, you telling me this shows me that you trust me. I am so grateful. And what does it allow for me? What does it make possible for me? It allows me to grow. It actually allows me not to worsen my relationships, but to strengthen them. It allows me to interrupt the internalized superiority that I've been socialized to have, and it fundamentally interrupts racism. This is part of practicing allyship. And so the more that I got my head around this, the more I asked myself, how can I learn more about this whiteness? Like we, we are, the whole staying oblivious to whiteness is one of the fundamental structures for upholding racism. So how can I learn more about whiteness? And I came across a beautiful open access teaching tool that was made available by an African-American scholar named Barner Hesse called the Eight White Identities. This is, who's seen this before, by the way? Anyone? So a few, yep. Uh, this, you, you, you Google it and you'll get a, whole bunch of examples that come up. It's a continuum. It is a continuum of white identities that goes from white supremacists that is clearly explicitly arguing in favor of white superiority all the way to the other end, white abolitionist, which is dismantling whiteness, dismantling whiteness. And in between, you have number two, where you wouldn't challenge a white supremacist, but you're not quite as vocal. Number three, where there's a deep investment in maintaining uh, white order, whether you may not even realize you're doing it, but this is about the folks that are saying diversity matters but not attending to inclusion. And down it goes. And then there's what we're doing right now, number six, maybe, trying to expose whiteness speaking back to whiteness. Number seven, actively refusing to be complicit with structural racism. And I think we're not just one of these. I think our actions, our behaviors match a bunch of them. And I want you to just take a look here and say, which do your actions, this is mostly for white folks, but it's all of us who have the potential to uphold racism. And so have a look and say, where do my actions align here? Either what I'm doing or because of what I am not doing. And I would propose it for myself. It's, I think I'm mostly a four, five, and six kind of person with a little bit of seven sometimes. But through my personal and professional day, I think my actions reflect about probably four, five, and six. <laughs> now, how many people have heard and or said this comment at any of your anti-oppression works, right? It's, it's, I, I've done it. And, and that's true. We need the other folks in the room. I think it's also false. I think that I am exactly the person that needs to be in the room for this education. And I'll tell you why. It's because I consider myself a white progressive, and by that I mean I have always been driven by social justice. I've devoted myself to a career in the caring professions. I eschew racism. And when I was mentioning this to Lana James, who is a great anti-black racism activist, a grad student of mine teaching me a lot, she said, Stephanie, health is where white progressives go. And I was like, oh, it's not even an accident. She's like, look around. Yeah. So it was a real wake-up call to me when I read this line from Robin DiAngelo's book, White Supremacy, where she says, I define white progressive as any white person who thinks he or she is not racist, or is less racist, or in the choir, or already gets it. White progressives can be the most difficult for people of color because to the degree that we think we have arrived, we will put our energy into making sure that others see us as having arrived. And she goes on to say, and these are, these are her italics, I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. I believe that white progressives, she's talking to me, cause the most daily damage to people of color. Now to my white colleagues in the room, tune in to the possibility of white fragility here. We are socialized to respond in a particular way when we are confronted with comments like that about our upholding racism. So how does your body feel? This, I go through this all the time. How does my body feel? What reaction zipped into my mind uninvited when I heard those words? But then I can see them for what they are. This happens all the time when I'm working with grad students. I have black and indigenous grad students. I'll say, hang on, I'm having a wave of white fragility. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of defensive. I'm starting not to believe what you're saying. 
and I'll take a shot of humility and a shot of self-compassion and I'll get back to the work. I'm like, okay, I'm back, let's go. And here's Desmond Cole on the same idea. White liberalism, he's talking to me. White liberalism is all about opposing racism in principle, putting it into our EDI statements, but not about putting our time and money and bodies where our mouth is. So I want to go back to these eight white identities, and I want to ask us to reflect on which, one of, which ones of these are dismantling white supremacy and structural racism, and which ones are not. And it's easy to see that the first two are clearly, clearly upholding structural racism, but I would propose that so are three, four, and five, and that it's six, seven, and eight where we're making real change. And so in my day, I think I fluctuate in my actions between four, five, six, and a little dash of seven. Sometimes I'm working against it to, to, to address the problem. And I think a lot of what I do through the day actually upholds it without me even realizing it. And so a metaphor that I learned from the great indigenous physician, Dr. Marcia Anderson, from her Peggy Hill lecture recently to further help us get our heads around this. So the yellow circle is the quarterback. That is the racialized person holding the ball trying to get to the other end of the football field. The metaphor is you get to the other end of the football field, that is dismantling racism. Where are the white people on this graph? Where am I in this image? I think a lot of the time I'm here. I think a lot of the time I'm on the team that's actually making it hard for that person to get this good work done. And it's not because I'm white identity one and two, it's because I'm white identity four and five. I don't mean to be doing that, and I am doing that. But Here's where I want to be and where I'm working very hard to get to figure out what this even looks like, is to actually be blocking for her, making space to help get the ball down the field. And here's what we really should be moving forward. A whole bunch of white folks doing anti-racist work in solidarity under the leadership of the person with the ball. That's what we're heading towards. And one way that I've found to help me with this is I've discovered a group called Standing Up for Racial Justice, or Surge TO, which is a collective that brings together white folks to do good anti-racist work under the leadership of BIPOC folks. So here's what we're being called to do. I'm speaking to my white colleagues in the audience and online. We are being called to step up. We are being called to relieve the burden of this work from exclusively being on the shoulders of our racialized colleagues. We are being called to understand that learning and unlearning is deeply important, but it is a means, it is not an end. And the ex to the extent that we focus on unlearning oppressions as the point, that continues to allow the status quo to, to stay strong. And so I'm asking us to keep our eye on the prize of real material change. But I'll propose that actually seeing in the health sciences, now other fields are very different, other fields are way out in front on this, but in the health sciences, actually seeing white folks taking real action, I'm talking about white identities six, seven, and eight, is extremely uncommon. What does it even look like? And so I just wanna offer you a few examples to make some things possible here. And the first is personal. So I mentioned that I have a number of black and or indigenous graduate students, and I'm at the point now that I have a trusting enough relationship with them that we regularly have this explicit discussion how can we disrupt white supremacy in the context of this relationship? It's ongoing, right? It is ongoing. And you know what my main role is with these students? They're the yellow dot, I'm the purple, trying to block, trying to just make space for them to get their work done and out of harm's way. And there are consistently dozens of experiences of harm from the folks who are the black exes. And you know what? Not a single one of those black ex folks is intended to cause harm but they did. Here's another example at the University of Saskatchewan, one of our great physiotherapy leaders, Peg Proctor. I asked her, tell me something wonderful that's happening around settlers and white settlers in particular. And she said, well, we've started the Buffalo Circle campaign. Cohorts of settler and mainly white settler uh, as settlers with, who are senior leadership at the university are nominated by indigenous faculty. They are guided to become a big critical mass, the next cohort arrives and now they all support the inner. And as put by Dr. Rose Roberts, who's one of the co-leads, she describes it like this. In the center of the buffalo herd are the young ones. In this case, the young are the up and coming allies. 
In the next circle are the nurturers. They're the ones who are going to be protecting and teaching the young ones, our new allies. And the outer circle has the experienced buffalo breaking new ground while guiding and protecting the inner circles. An intentional structure for helping white folks and settlers come to understand our complicity in these structures and how to act differently, how to resist them. For those of us who are scholars and researchers, it's not just engaging in racism in our research, it's engaging in our whiteness. Where does this fit into the scholarly work that we're doing? And this beautiful example, in March of this year, the School of Social Work at York had a one-week teach-in on white supremacy. Every single class across that program for one week was about white supremacy and the linkages to settler colonialism, fascism, and the new right. A full week. So to close, I want to tell you something that I'm really energized by. And it's an insight that actually preparing for this talk helped me arrive at, which is that the work we need to do in the health sciences to dismantle racism, what I see happening all over the place, and I am so, is wonderful, is making the space for black and indigenous and racialized bodies and ideas and leadership. And that is crucial. It is necessary. It is not sufficient. In addition to that, we need a new kind of whiteness. For this to actually change, white folks need to reimagine our relationship to whiteness. Or as put by the great scholar here at the University of Toronto, Ronaldo Walcott, Ronaldo Walcott the structures that require radical transformation to change the ongoing global administration of life and death cannot be transformed without the transformation of whiteness. And such a transformation can only occur if people marked as white. That's me. I understand I'm implicated. I understand what that means. And I am prepared to act to shift whiteness itself. Thank you. So that concludes the f facilitated portion of our event. We still have a few minutes after just uh, to discuss and network with each other. Um, but first, a huge, a huge thank you to all of the attendees for engaging so thoughtfully throughout the night and what can feel like heavy conversations. And I would like to very warmly thank our brilliant speakers. Thank you, Dr. Ruthika Goel, Dr. Janet Smiley, Dr. Janelle Joseph, and Dr. Stephanie Nixon for those fantastic presentations. We have a small token of our gratitude for you. Thank you. Um, thank you as well to Dr. Lisa Robinson for helping to lead us through the um, moderated portions of the event. I know you're also not feeling well tonight, so thank you so much for being here and leading us and your constant leadership. Um, thank you as well to those who made the event possible, including all of our Heart House, the, uh, uh, Heart House event staff, the Diversity Moves Us staff, Daisy, Francesca, Michelle, Golnaz, and Sandiki for helping lead us through conversations. And thank you to U of T Sport and Recreation for partnering with us through their Equity Ideas Fund. Thank you to the um, OID uh, staff, Office of Inclusion and Diversity staff, who are endlessly supportive of these events, um, putting them all together. Christina Stavinik, uh, Vanessa Norozzi, and uh, as well as the Director of Equity diversity inclusion, Anita Balakrishna, who helped to facilitate many of the, the portions of the event. Thank you. Um, so the Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity Office, or ARCDO as it's often called, um, for, for those who are looking for more resources and wanting to further engage, is an ongoing uh, resource for U of T folks to connect around issues of race. And they also offer speaker series and other events such as the International Day of the Elimination of Racial Discrimination Conference, which is coming up on March 20th. And some presenters from the Faculty of Medicine will be there. And you can connect with um, that office after this event if you'd like more resources. And I also invite Faculty of Medicine community members to connect with our office directly if you'd like to continue this conversation. Um, lastly, please do fill out the event evalu evaluation that you'll receive in your email sometime tomorrow when you receive it in your inbox. Now I'm pleased to invite you to continue to uh, network with each other 
uh, and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much for being here with us today.